What if I told you a struggling student, dismissed by his elite professor as nothing more than a diversity quota, ended up creating a mathematical breakthrough that stunned the entire academic world? This isn't just a story about numbers. It's about pride, prejudice, and the moment a quiet young man stood up and rewrote the rules of the game. And if you're watching this and believe brilliance can come from the most unexpected places, help this channel reach 1,000 subscribers by hitting that button and turning on the bell. Now, let me take you into the true story of the student they tried to break and the revolution he started instead. Elijah Carter stepped into the lecture hall of St. Well University, one of the top private institutions in the country. He wasn't wearing tailored suits or leather shoes like the others. Just jeans, a hand-me-down hoodie, and a backpack stitched at the straps. To the rest of the students, he was invisible. But to Professor Malcolm Everett, he was a target. Everett didn't believe in educational charity. He believed in tradition, bloodlines, and calculus the way it had been taught for 200 years. And he had no patience for students like Elijah. Brilliant, but from the wrong zip code. Mr. Carter, Everett announced during the first lecture, why don't you come solve this? The equation he scrawled across the board wasn't on the syllabus. It wasn't even undergraduate-level work. It was brutal, a combination of multivariable calculus and abstract linear transformations. Elijah's palms sweat, but he walked to the board and started working. He didn't solve it like they taught in class. He sketched, visualized, treated the problem like a moving shape in space. The room went silent as he wrote the final answer. Everett's response? Interesting. A lucky guess, perhaps. Memorization without understanding. The class chuckled. Elijah returned to his seat, face burning. Only one student, his friend Devin, looked at him with respect. After class, Professor Everett handed Elijah an extra set of problems. You'll do these in addition to the regular homework. Let's see what you're really capable of. They weren't just hard. They were near impossible. Graduate students would struggle, but Elijah said nothing. That night, under the flickering kitchen light in his one-room apartment, Elijah spread out the sheets and began. The first few hours were painful. Nothing worked. He tried every formula, every method he knew. Midnight passed. 2 a.m. came. But then, something shifted. He stopped thinking like a student. Stopped following the rules. He looked at the problems like puzzles. Visual, dynamic, alive. He began drawing diagrams instead of equations imagining the curves and twists as 3D structures. And suddenly, the answers started to reveal themselves. By dawn, Elijah had solved them all using a technique that wasn't in any textbook. Something new. Something powerful. The next morning, he placed his work on Professor Everett's desk. The man barely glanced at it. Acceptable, he muttered, and tossed it aside. It stung. But that night, Elijah didn't collapse from exhaustion. He opened a new notebook. He had an idea. He wasn't just going to solve problems. He was going to change how problems were solved. Elijah's days began blending into nights. While others enjoyed parties or planned ski trips, he lived in libraries and study rooms. His notebook, once a blank spiral-bound pad, was now packed with geometric symbols abstract curves, and diagrams that looked more like architectural sketches than equations. But every success brought a new challenge. Professor Everett had escalated. During lectures, Elijah was always the example, always the one summoned to the board with the hardest problems, always given extra assignments, most of them ripped from postgraduate research. The class watched. Some smirked. Others stayed silent. Then came the breaking point. Everett waited until the department's dean was seated in the back of the hall, 
a routine curriculum review. Then, with the air of a magician preparing his final trick, he wrote a problem so massive it filled three boards. Elijah, he said, would you care to attempt this? Whispers swirled like wildfire. Elijah stepped forward. His hands trembled as he stared at the chaos of symbols. This wasn't just an equation, it was a setup. He started anyway, first with traditional methods, derivatives, substitutions, but the problem was a maze of contradictions. Nothing fit. Minutes ticked by. Sweat dotted his brow. Behind him, Everett coughed theatrically. No shame in acknowledging your limits, Mr. Carter laughter broke out. Elijah stopped. I can't solve it, he admitted, voice hollow. Precisely, Everett said, wiping the board like a stage magician erasing a trick. Innovation is no substitute for understanding. The humiliation was complete. That night Elijah didn't eat, didn't sleep. He opened the notebook again, but this time not to solve Everett's puzzle. This time he wanted to understand why the problem was unsolvable. What made it different? What pattern was hidden underneath? And then, between sleepless hours and scribbled lines, he saw it. Everett's problems weren't just hard, they were strategically hard, designed to make non-traditional thinking collapse, to expose flaws in new approaches. Everett wasn't teaching math, he was running a war on innovation. Once Elijah understood the game Everett was playing, he changed his approach. He wasn't just solving math problems anymore, he was reverse engineering a strategy. He started compiling every unsolvable problem Everett had given him, studying the patterns, finding the traps. It was like decoding a battle plan. Each equation punished risk-taking. Every integral was a minefield for visual thinkers. Everett wasn't just testing knowledge, he was trying to prove that new ideas didn't belong in serious mathematics. But Elijah wasn't alone anymore. Devin had quietly started helping, fact-checking solutions, hunting references, and even designing digital models of Elijah's geometric ideas. They turned the basement of the student union into a kind of underground lab, and soon someone unexpected joined them. Lena Moreau, top of the class, future Harvard-bound. She had once rolled her eyes when Elijah sketched during lectures. But now, she was here, holding one of his diagrams in stunned silence. This isn't just math, she said. This is visual logic, like you're seeing equations as objects in space. That's exactly what it is, Elijah replied. Math doesn't have to be linear. It can be spatial, intuitive. Lena joined the sessions, and with her help, Elijah refined his method into something more formal. He called it Geometric Integration Theory, GIT. They began applying it to other areas. Wave functions, theoretical physics, cryptography. It didn't just work, it excelled. Problems that took traditional methods hours were solved in minutes. Even some professors began to take quiet notice. But Everett? He doubled down. He started planting traps in lectures offhand comments designed to spark confrontation, snide remarks in front of visiting faculty, and worst of all, another challenge. I'd like Mr. Carter to attempt a demonstration, Everett announced one day, his voice laced with something venomous, a problem drawn from active research in multivariable topology. A hush fell over the room. Even Lena looked uncertain, the problem Everett wrote was monstrous. Four nested integrals, non-Euclidean components, rotating coordinate frames. Elijah didn't flinch. He walked to the board and, for the first time, began with a sketch. What is he doing? Someone whispered. Everett smirked. Elijah drew spirals, intersecting loops, three D arrows. Then he translated them into symbols. His hands moved with purpose, 
drawing not just lines, but ideas. He spoke as he worked. Instead of treating this as a chain of functions, he said, I'm visualizing it as a single, multidimensional object unfolding through space. He finished in five minutes, and the answer was correct. The class sat in stunned silence. Everett's expression didn't change. Elegant, he said coldly. But show me the rigor. Creativity is nothing without structure. But Elijah didn't argue. He just smiled. Because for the first time, he knew Everett was afraid. Word began to spread. Elijah's method wasn't just a curiosity anymore. It was a challenge to the entire department. Students started showing up to observe his board work. Professors peeked through lecture hall windows. Some whispered support. Others dismissed him as a clever showman. But one person wasn't whispering. Dean Abigail Flores. A former theoretical physicist turned administrator, Dean Flores requested a private meeting with Elijah. I've been reviewing your recent problem sets, she said, placing a thick folder on the table. You've essentially proposed a new visualization-based framework for multidimensional integration. This isn't just undergraduate work. This is doctoral-level innovation. Elijah felt his pulse quicken. Who's been assigning you these? Flores asked. Professor Everett, he answered quietly. She leaned back, eyes narrowing. I thought so. Flores had been compiling complaints. Over the past seven years, students, mostly minorities, first-gen scholars or transfer students, had quietly withdrawn from Everett's classes. Some transferred schools entirely. Others abandoned STEM altogether. All had a common thread. They were punished for thinking differently. This ends now, Flores said. You've done more than survive, Elijah. You've built something better, and I intend to shine a light on it. But Everett had one final move. At the semester's end, with faculty from across the country visiting for a special symposium, he scheduled Elijah to present during a panel on unconventional methods in STEM education. Officially, it was an opportunity. Unofficially, it was a trap. The day of the panel arrived. The lecture hall was packed. Deans, visiting professors, department heads, journalists. Everett introduced Elijah with subtle venom. Mr. Carter will be demonstrating his imaginative approach to integration, he said, with a polite smile that didn't reach his eyes. Elijah stepped up. This time, he wasn't nervous. He wasn't just fighting to prove himself anymore. He was proving that a different way of thinking had value. He began with a story, his story. Then he presented one of Everett's unsolvable problems, explained why traditional methods failed, then showed how his method transformed the chaos into clarity. He didn't just solve it, he made it beautiful. When he finished, the room was silent for a beat and then exploded with applause. Not everyone clapped, but enough did, enough to know the tide had shifted. And that Professor Everett? He had just lost control of the narrative. In the weeks following the symposium, everything changed. Elijah's inbox overflowed with messages, grad school offers, research invitations, collaboration requests, MIT Stanford. Even an institute in Zurich wanted to fund a full research project based on his method. But the real shock came from the Mathematics Review Board. They wanted to publish his work. For the first time in its 75-year history, the journal would feature a visual integrative method created by an undergraduate. The academic world was officially paying attention, but not everyone was celebrating. The university opened a formal review into Professor Everett's teaching history. Dean Flores had collected years' worth of testimonials from students who had been silenced, pressured, and pushed out. They weren't invisible anymore. At the faculty hearing, Everett tried to defend himself. 
I challenged students to bring out their potential, he said. Isn't that what we're here to do? Flores responded without raising her voice. You didn't challenge students. You sabotaged them. Especially those who didn't come from wealth or legacy. You made brilliance conditional on conformity. The panel was unmoved. Everett was suspended indefinitely, his tenure placed under formal review. After the hearing, something unexpected happened. As Elijah packed up his notes, a tall figure approached him, older, composed, wearing a worn gray suit. Mr. Carter, he said softly, I'm Everett's father. I came to watch the hearing. Elijah froze. I spent my life teaching math by the book, the man continued. My son idolized me, maybe too much. But what you've created, it's something we never thought possible. I'm sorry for how he treated you, but I'm grateful for what you've done. Elijah didn't know what to say, but he nodded. Sometimes the most powerful apologies come from where they're least expected. Later that evening, he returned to the old study room, the one where it all began. Devin and Lena were there, already organizing papers. A new student had joined, too, a quiet freshman who reminded Elijah of himself. We're calling it the Carter Lab now, Devin grinned. Unofficial. But it's becoming a thing. Elijah looked around. Whiteboards filled with drawings. Laughter in the air, and for the first time, he felt like he belonged. A year later, the Carter Lab wasn't just a nickname. It had become an officially recognized research group at St. Well University, backed by grants, guided by faculty, and powered by students from all walks of life. The room where Elijah once sat alone at 2 a.m. had transformed into a hub of collaborative chaos, buzzing with ideas. And Elijah? He was no longer the kid professors overlooked. He was now the youngest research fellow in the university's history. But he never forgot what started it all. That's why he chose to spend his time mentoring first-year students, especially the ones who looked unsure, out of place, like they weren't meant to be here. One of those students, a girl named Kiana, with sharp eyes and a shy voice, lingered after class one day. Professor Carter she said softly, still getting used to the title. Do you really think someone like me can make it in this field? He smiled. You don't make it by being someone else. You make it by being exactly who you are. She nodded slowly, holding her notebook close. And Elijah saw something familiar in her eyes, an ember, just waiting to catch fire. Outside the lecture hall, a plaque had recently been installed. It read, In honor of Elijah Carter, whose courage to think differently redefined how we solve the impossible. Visitors stopped to read it. Some took pictures. But for Elijah, the real legacy wasn't in the plaque. It was in every student who saw math not as a gatekeeper, but as a language they could finally speak. In a world where genius is often judged by pedigree instead of passion, Elijah Carter reminds us that true brilliance doesn't always follow tradition. It rewrites it. His journey teaches us this. Innovation doesn't need permission, and ideas that start in silence can end up changing the world. So if you've ever felt like you didn't belong, remember, your difference might be your greatest advantage. If you believe stories like this deserve to be heard, help this channel reach 1,000 subscribers. Hit that subscribe button, smash the like, and leave a comment. What's one time you proved someone wrong just by refusing to give up? Together, we can inspire more people to see the brilliance in themselves.